We will be starting in approximately two minutes to Good evening. Welcome to Barbershop Talk. This is our third installment. My name is Jermaine Porter. I'm the Boys of Color Initiative Coordinator here in Durham Public Schools. And my name is Dr. Daniel Kelvin Bullock. I'm the Executive Director for Equity Affairs for Durham Public Schools. So we'd like to once again welcome all of you here. For those of you, this is your first time. We're so glad to have you here. We're actually streaming live. Um, and whenever you get home, if you miss something or you want to hear about it, make sure you go to Durham Public Schools website and you'll be able to find the link and you'll be able to click on that. But we want to make sure that you understand what we're, the purpose and why we're doing it and let you know a little bit that's happened in our first two Barbershop Talk series that brought us to this moment tonight. So the Barbershop Talk series is simply talking about building systems to support boys of color in Durham Public Schools. Our district, our superintendent has been very intentional about talking about our disparities with our boys of color within Durham Public Schools. 
be it suspension rates, be it academically, be it graduation rates. So what we want to do is make sure that we're creating systems around them to support them. So where we are now is not where we're going to be. So that is why these conversations are crucial. And they're not just conversations. We're trying to create a movement. So our very first barbershop talk series, we had principals, we had district personnel talking, but we wanted to make sure in our second installment that we centered our students' voices and actually listened to what they had to say. And our students said some powerful things, and you have an opportunity, if you missed that, to go to Durham Public Schools' webpage to view that particular barbershop talk series too. But one of the things that stood out to me was the students saying that they wanted our teachers and they wanted everyone to be consistent with them and to build relationships with them. And that's important. One another student made a comment, sometimes they feel as though they're walking around with a target on their back. And if a student is just feeling that they're walking around with a target on their back, how do you think they're gonna respond when someone is saying certain things to them and not really building relationships to understand? So that brings us to tonight, where we're gonna have some parents on the panel we're actually waiting on two additional parents to come in, but we're gonna go ahead and get started because I wanna make sure that I respect everyone's time. But before we get started, we have an awesome person who is our chief operating officer here in Durham Public Schools. Um, I'm so glad he said that he would come and speak tonight because this is an important week for him and me. Uh, we both graduated from the North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University. Aggie Pride. Aggie Pride, I was, <laughs> Aggie Pride. excuse me. So we want to make sure that we recognize that in Durham with all the eagles around. And we recognize that everyone makes mistakes and we forgive you and we love you nonetheless, nonetheless. But ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce to you our chief operating officer who was a parent here in Durham Public Schools, Mr. Julius Monk. Good evening, everyone. Uh, when Mr. Po uh, Porter and Dr. Bullock uh, asked me to do this, um, I was a little concerned. I didn't know exactly what it was because I hadn't heard about it before. And so for the past month, every time I run into Mr. Porter in the hall, I say, y you know, exactly what am I supposed to do whenever I do the welcome? He said, don't worry about it, man. Just get up there and tell them about your experience being a parent and stuff. And so I saw him again today. And I asked him the same thing. I said, now, come on, Jermaine, help me out, man. What am I supposed to say whenever I get up there and, and talk to these folks? He said, man, I don't care what you say. Just do it in five minutes. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and, and get started. So um, I was, I'm, I'm in graduate school still. And one of the books that I read was The, the Trouble with Black Boys, written by Pedro Negrawa. And that's an interesting title for a book especially me being a black uh, male and having two black sons of my own. But there's a couple of quotes that I want to read um, from that book to help set the stage for tonight for the parents that are going to be up here um, speaking and, and fielding your questions. Um, the first quote is, when the norms associated with race take on a static and determining quality, they can be very difficult to undermine. Students who receive a lot of support and encouragement at home may be more likely to cross over and work against these separations. And then he goes on to talk about he and his wife experience. He says, but as my wife and I found uh, with their son, who's a middle class African American, he said, the kids who excel in school often find that this can't be done because the peer pressures against crossing these boundaries are too great. He goes on to say that the stereotypical images that we hold toward groups are powerful in influencing what people see and expect of students. Unless educators consciously try to undermine and work against these kinds of stereotypes, they often act on them unconsciously. Our assumptions related to race are so deeply entrenched that it is virtually impossible for us not to hold them unless we take conscious and deliberate actions. So not only being a parent, but also being an employee at Durham Public Schools, I have to remind myself, even as an African-American male, as an African-American male who came up in the public school system, that I, everything that I do must be conscious and intentional. I gotta apply equity lens in everything that I do. Right now, the school district is moving because of the growth, and um, Mr. Porter talked about it, 
Uh, we're moving to have to change our boundary attendance zones. And that has to be done with a conscious and intentional effort to make sure that we don't unintentionally cause there to be disparities both with race and socioeconomics. So as I close, I want to leave you with a story. Um, whenever I was an elementary school student, I was in the fourth grade. And I had a teacher that told me, she said, Macon, I changed my name whenever I got a little bit older because Julia sounded more sophisticated. She said, um, she said, you're nothing but a nappy-headed black boy. Ha, 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 and laugh, right? But that was not the end of my story because I get to stand before you all today, the chief operating officer of the Durham Public Schools, and I get to say to her, girl, look at me now. All right, thank you. So we're about to transition to introducing um, our panelists. So in a moment, uh, Mr. Porter will be returning up here to uh, transition us into that. But I think, I think we may have um, some people coming in, so. So in Durham Public Schools, many of you don't even know this, but we actually have a coordinator for parent engagement. His name is Gregory Jones. He's an outstanding person, former administrator here in Durham Public Schools, and he's going to be our moderator this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Mr. Gregory Jones. Thank you, Mr. Porter, for that introduction. I'm looking forward to a wonderful night of hearing our parents as we speak on how to build systems for our boys of color. And at this time, we will introduce our panelists for tonight. First, coming to the stage, Miss Tabitha Walker. She is the parent of a sixth grade middle school student. Next, coming to the stage, we have Paula Jennings, proud parent of two students, both middle and high school. Our next panelist coming to the stage, Miss Yolanda Bratcher, parent of a high school student. Last, but certainly not least, a fill-in panelist to even out our team for tonight. We have Dr. Kelvin Bullock. Thank you, thank you, thank you, panelist. As we begin our night, first I would like for each one of you to introduce yourself and explain why you agree to participate on this panel. Hello, good evening. My name is Tabitha Walker with a 13-year-old that attends uh, middle school. Um, to discuss boys of color with the hopes of the school system's concerns get addressed. Voices can be heard with raising boys of color. Hello everybody, I'm Paula Jennings. I am actually the grandmother of three boys of color that are enrolled in Durham Public Schools, a 12, 13, and a 16 year old. 
Um, the reason I accept it, other than because I was asked, <laughs> is because I hope that something that comes out of my mouth might stick or help someone, including my boys. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Yolanda Bratcher, and ironically enough, um, I was having a conversation with Mr. Jones, um, who is the, the Title I um, engagement coordinator, and he is formerly my son's uh, first grade teacher. Uh, so he definitely made an impact on our lives, but we had had a conversation about um, me getting more, gaining more insight into um, how to bridge the gaps between boys of color and DPS, especially in the area of uh, long-term suspension. And he actually connected me with Mr. Porter, and I'm here today. And again, my name is Dr. Kelvin Bullock, um, and I'm, I agreed to be a part of this panel, you know, um, um, not too long ago. And I agreed because as, as the father of a son in Durham Public Schools, I think it's um, essential and vital that we think about how we as parents engage with schools um, around how we support our boys in being successful in our schools. So happy to be here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I think we can all can agree that being a parent is an awesome responsibility, period. And when we begin to have conversations about being the parent of a boy or boys of color, there is another level of preparation a parent must provide. So my question, what is one thing you wish people knew about raising a boy of color? Who would like to start? Well, okay. Um, so one thing, if, if I could, you know, I have a host of things um, that I would want people um, of non-color uh, to understand is that um, I actually walk around in constant fear for my son's life uh, due to some preconceived notions. And when I mean life, I mean, you know, like his entire life cycle. So that means um, economically, emotionally, um, and physically. Um, because of those preconceived notions um, and sometimes the target that may be put on his back, um, I feel like that that could um, have great impacts on his livelihood, you know, as far as making money, um, emotionally, you know, having self-confidence and also physically because um, I don't think that he can always walk out and do the same things that his uh, non-black counterparts um, can actually do. So um, constant fear would be mine, but, and, and sometimes, you know, it's subconsciously, but we are having, you know, active conversations about um, how you conduct yourself as an African-American boy. Thank you, thank you. Okay, um, when raising a boy of color can be hard at, but with certain situations and issues, um, but being patient and understanding, it, it helps build their self-esteem, um, it helps build their self-worth, um, being a coach of leadership, teaching them the rights and wrong, is growing uh, to be truthful to things so people can understand and understand them as growing up as being a black boy. Uh, being a black boy, I, I, I really, don't, I don't want to take it off topic, but it's boys in, in general. Um, being a black boy is uh, it's very hard. Uh, we have to think about the things that they're going through when they're not with, with us. You know, are they targeted? Are they being heard when they're being targeted? Are they telling us what, what's going on with them? Can, how can we help them? And if we don't have the answers for them, then we're failing them. And then we're bringing, taking them back out. When we have them back out, then they don't know we should start with their teaching in the home of raising black men of color, boys of color. Okay. Thank you. You know, um, Durham Public Schools has the Exceptional Children's um, Program has the motto, we see you. And I think um, for me, what I would want people to know about raising a, a young African-American male is do you see them? 
I mean really see them beyond the physical, the exterior um, that's before you. Deep down, what is it that they're trying to say to you? Are you listening? Do you hear me? Um, trying to fight and struggle just to have a place. And I'm talking every color, every boy of color. Um, and just to know that all family dynamics don't look the same. Um, and even with that, to know that my child might be more privileged than yours or vice versa, they're still human. And they are still somebody's child. I think if we keep that in the forefront of our minds, I think that would be an awesome, awesome thing, just to know that this child is somebody's. And um, si similar to the point uh, that she made about uh, exceptional children's services and the message, I see you, or we see you, I think it's very important one of the things I think about in raising my son in particular is the need to pour into him and to constantly affirm him and who he is. There are so many things out here that will seek to pull him away from developing a strong identity and a strong racial identity and a strong identity as a young man. And so the, the, whatever we can do as a community, as a school system, to pour into our boys um, the strong values that we will want to, them to embody and also working to embody those values ourselves because they, we see them, but they see us. And a lot of times what we do will speak louder than the words that we share. So we have to make sure that we're embodying what we want to see from them and pour into them. And when we do that, we see positive outcomes from them, so. Thank you. We, as parents, we trust the professionals in our schools to educate our children and to keep them safe. Our children are in the school building, usually seven to eight hours a day, five days a week, not counting extracurricular activities before and after school, sports. Therefore, we have a shared responsibility, both parents and educators in supporting our boys of color. Panelists, can you describe what a healthy relationship looks like between parents and schools that are working together to support boys of color? Well, parents can get in tune with the schools, help with homework, build a communication with the teachers, teacher or teachers, find out from, what, from them what they can do to help. Teachers also should take t more time to hear and try to understand boys with color, reach out to parents with, with the hope of finding a solution, solution to any situation, encourage the teachers and hope boys of color will help, will be helped and, and, and treated, a prop um, I'm sorry, appropriately. Um, we have kids, more kids nowadays that like uh, Ms. Yolanda has shared, that does have an IEP. And, and sometimes if we, we are there, we are home with just that one child versus the school system, they're with 17 to 20 kids. So it's not, it's gonna be very hard to distinguish what level this child is on. And sometimes that makes it hard for the teacher. So we can, you know, we can get a bond together. Maybe this, maybe we can start, they can start during the summer. If they can get information, about the kids that they're coming to the in, they're about to enter their class that that come upcoming year they can read up on it a little and and then with our help to help them come to the school before school even start um i did that you know before school even start go to the school and give them a little bit of, of your child and to help them and maybe they hope in hopes that the teacher can remember the things that you told them and they can help and can help works with the child better Um, I believe open communication, like with any relationship, there has to be nurturing, there has to be uh, rapport, of course, and um, I believe there has to be um, a level of trust. And just, just to kind of witness to that, you know, there is a school that I'm familiar with, a high school here in the, in the system, 
where the teachers are literally mandated to call the parents every two weeks. And in, that, in those communications, the, the um, teachers are to relay what's going on, of course, in, in school academically. But they are encouraged, first of all, to speak strengths and, and, and give a good report to actually use the sandwich effect. That's still something that works. And what it does is gives opportunity for parents to trust the system, to work, I think, even closer, closer with the students, and just to let me know that you care about my child. And I think just building that rapport and on purpose, on purpose, not because that's my job, but on purpose. It has to be intentional. And the thing about it is almost like with a baby. They know if you're serious or not. And they will walk away or give you honesty like you never expected. And I think just being real will make the difference because we know. Um, so partnership is... Uh is the biggest thing, but with partnership, you have to have respect, um, a level of, not a level, you have to have full transparency, you have to have open lines of communication, and you have to be deliberate. Um, and you don't always have to agree, but you have to agree to disagree. And so um, I would say that the partnership should be free of, as much as possible, any biases that come with it, you know, based on how I may look, um, how my student may look, or how the teacher looks, um, socioeconomic uh, issues. And it just needs to be an even playing field so that, uh, that we can get the work done and be able to build these children up and love on them. When I think about um, healthy relationships between parents and schools, I, the first thing I think about is just healthy communication and two-way communication. I mean, what was shared earlier about um, educators being prompted to make sure that they're reaching out and, say, and starting with something positive um, when, when speaking to a parent about their child, like that's essential. And I, I've noticed that in communications with my son's teachers. Like, you know, I, I really need, as a parent, I need you to be able to say something, something positive about my son before you hit me with, you know, um, if you have some challenges you might be experiencing. But, but it, it, that, that framing really matters in developing that relationship. And I, I feel like um, it's important for parents and for educators to really think with our boys in particular, we need to be in a mindset of going an extra mile to make sure that that relationship is there and that we're working together for that child's success. Um, what, what we often see is that those, those kids in the schools who are not connected to adults in the schools, those are the ones that you know, sometimes experience the most issues. And so I know as a parent, I wanna make sure that um, I'm there and the teacher sees me, but also for those parents who can't be there, um, I also want to make sure I'm standing in the gap for them because just because a parent isn't physically present doesn't mean they're not supporting and wanting the best for their child. So, you know, I'm thankful for us being up here and we're able to speak this evening. And I, and I think it's also important for us to be mindful of sometimes we have to speak up and make sure, you know, other kids are being treated fairly in schools too. And, and that'll go a long way. Thank you, thank you. I, I heard a lot about relationships, a lot about trust. And I, I would dare say with your child's matriculation through school that you have heard a lot of good things as it relates to what educators are doing for your child. And it can be easy for teachers principals, district leaders, to talk about how important it is to reach boys of color. And the conversations that we're having tonight, these are not new conversations. These are things that we've been talking about for quite a while now. Yet, 
we find ourselves still talking about the achievement gap, still talking about the disparity in school discipline data as it relates to boys of color. So panelists, my, my question is, what do you see as the biggest disconnect between the needs of boys of color and the opportunities provided by schools? How can we bridge this gap? Well, I mean, oh my gosh. Um, kids can learn on different, the kids learn on different levels. Um, all of us are on different levels. So with um, the, uh, closing the gap, you can think of once you learn your ch the child, that your student, the student that you have, this student has a problem with this. Find some kind of project to hold that child's attention so the child can be where he, that child knows, okay, I'm, I'm focusing on this. I'm not disrupting the class. I'm not doing things that I don't supposed to do. I'm not um, bothering anyone. Not to say that they're bothering anyone, but their attention span. You have to, you have, we have to understand some kids have, a, have a learning problems. Some kids have it's different things, different mood swings with, 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 with these kids. And if we, we showed them, like it was said up here before, if we can't build that trust, who can they trust? So they, they, they need to trust the teacher. Find something for them to do. Give them a little project. Someone in the office, pull them out for like five or 10 minutes. Give them a little relief and, and, and let them go back to the classroom. Um, their level of learning ability may need more attention. Again, parents and, and, and the, the, the school need to be connected. We need to, we need to be more connected with one another on our boys. We need to be that voice that someone, someone needs to hear the voice. And if they hear the parent's voice, then they know, okay, this is what, we, maybe we can do this or maybe we can do, you know, something like that. But for, first, a voice needs to be heard. Um, one way I think we can um, close that gap is, you know, um, it could be something as simple as celebrating our boys. Um, and for instance, one of my grandchildren um, was attacked by a student. And, you know, we teach them, you know, you want to tell them sometimes, you're mad, but you cannot. So we teach them, you really have to restrain. You literally have to turn the other cheek. And it might be a challenge, but you have to do it. And, you know, just having to teach them that way, um, I think, let me go back to the story. So the child was being attacked. And my grandson, and this was in front of other teachers and students, so my grandson literally just turned away and this kid continued to pound him. So the fortunate thing and the thing that I, um, the beauty of it for me was after this happened and my grandson actually was able to explain the situation and administration looked back over the, uh, the cameras and saw what he said was so. But what really got me was the principal set out to find him to celebrate what he had done because it was rare. So to me, when he told me, he told me with, I'll say, with such a pride that he didn't realize he had, but he was excited that he had done what he was told and that it panned out for him. And I think that if we celebrate these kids, and not only just pull out what they're doing that's wrong and telling them they're bad and realizing they're not bad. We all just don't always make the best decision, but that doesn't make me bad. But to celebrate our children, I mean, with intensity, celebrate them, pull them out, tell them you're doing a good job. I see you, you're worth it. I knew you could do it. I just wanted you to want to do it more than I wanted you to. You know, and I think celebrating, it's so simple, it's so easy, but it will take someone to look beyond their own biases, to look at themselves and look again, and to want to make the change. And when we begin to 
uh, walk what we talk, we're going to see a great difference in Durham Public Schools. I believe that. So some of the big, biggest disconnects that I see between um, boys of color and opportunities provided by the school is, you know, the, the status quo uh, systematic inequalities like um, the, the gap in um, education and long-term suspension and, and things of that nature. Um, but I definitely think that um, what DPS can actually do is um, engage uh, more mentors like like the doctor said because there are times where parents are not always available and then there are times where parents may not have had a good uh, a good opportunity in schools themselves so they are not always um, apt to come into the school and, and try to advocate for their children or they haven't been taught to do so um, I think that we need to be able to engage people that are willing to stand in the gaps uh, for those children. Um, I think we definitely need more access um, to mental health help because I think that um, there are a lot of children out here that boys of color and, and children period that are having to um, contend with a lot of stuff that, that we can't see in schools and sometimes it, it, it plays out. Um, one, a big thing for me is that I, I really wish that um, we as far as like SROs go in the school, that, um, that is, is less of a, a law and order type deal and more of a mentorship. I know um, that those are paid roles, but I would love to see um, some of those police officers um, take the hands of, of the boys of color and, you know, especially the ones where they see kind of going down the wrong path and give them opportunities of, word of words of encouragement or celebrate them um, when they're doing what they are uh, supposed to do. I think that DPS um, teachers and administrators, administration and staff, they definitely need to um, engage more as far as learning who these children are on an individual basis. Um, we can't treat all children the same. They all learn different. Um, so we have to be intimately involved um, in their education and their success beyond DPS um, and speak life into these children. Um, I also think that Again, open lines of communication and, and transparency, welcoming parents and community leaders in to, um, to help bridge the gaps for all children, but especially boys of color. And I think that we definitely need to, to figure out how to um, engage more improvement teams and get more insight from the community and parents on um, how the school should be run and what the curriculum looks like because uh, children Sometimes if, if, if they're not interested in um, what's being taught, we need to try to engage them in a way that they like being taught, whether it, whether it be social media, um, phones, or, you know, I think that we definitely, we have a lot of opportunity. And kind of piggybacking off of that point about um, thinking about social media, like, we, we really have to change the default mindset we have towards our boys. Like, they're bringing all this knowledge, this expertise, this energy to our schools every day. And how are we seeing that as a, as a, as a gift, as an area of genius for them, where we can use that to build upon and to further their educational experience? Like, there's a lot of potential there. And I feel like with boys of color, particularly black and Latino boys, we don't always see that energy as something positive. Like, so they're coming in with all this energy. And I know, I mean, for my son, I'm sending him to school every day. It's a lot of energy going into his classroom every day. And, and I, I keep his teacher in my thoughts, you know, cause I'm like, that's a lot of energy. And it's not just him, it's his peers too. But are, when that energy comes in the room, are we gonna like try to squash that or try to, you know, like, or, or are we going to use that to, as, a, as a tool to further their education? And, and that's a challenge. Like, that's, that's really difficult to do. Um, historically, our schools have not been constructed to do that. And I don't say that just for DPS, that's schools in general. So, you know, that's a, that's a changing mindset. And like, like we're saying, 2019 social media, these kids have an expertise of technology that adult, we can't keep up with that. 
So how, how do we provide a way for them to use that, for them to use that as a tool to learn? So um, yeah, I feel like those are some of the biggest disconnects for us to address. So I want to take a moment to um, present some questions from our audience. So uh, I'd like to start off with this question. How can teachers engage less hands-on parents who ignore the 560 number when it pops up on their caller ID? How can teachers engage less hands-on parents who ignore the 560 number when it pops up on the caller ID? So personally for me, um, at the beginning of each school year, so I have uh, two, two high school students, and um, I definitely reach out and you know introduce myself, if not in person, but definitely uh, via email and uh, one thing that I always say at the, the conclusion of my email um, Feel free to always contact me at any time, you know to discuss my children's successes And any opportunities for improvement and so um, I think that if teachers um, Kind of went in with that mindset to say hey uh, Johnny is is doing an awesome job um, he you know, made 110 on the spelling test um, every day, but um, I think that he's being a little too social during instructional time, you know, um, how can we come and work together on that? But then also, again, I think it's systematic. We have to, as a, as a whole DPS, we'll need to try to figure out how to better engage parents, period, because like I said before, um, some parents may not have had a good experience um, during those uh, formative years. And so we have to figure out a way to, to break those generational, I don't wanna say curses, but gaps so that we can get more people, um, more parents in the schools and you know more people from the community. I had to ask you to repeat that question because me personally, five, six, zero, um, I don't care where I'm at, I'm answering. <laughs> I'm answering, but um, I can relate to what Ms. Yolanda said with that. Um, my thing is um, reaching me is never going to be a problem, but we do have some that you can't reach. And if if I could, I'd go out here and find every last one of them. Because I mean, if, if it's the problem, is not just that one child. It can be the child that you're at home not answering that five six zero call child. If I'm saying it where you all can get what I'm saying. But you know, if we all as a parent can understand at home, we have these kids at home, majority of the day, summertime, majority of the summer, we should know our child. So therefore, if the 560 come and you, and you ignore the, the, the call, you're the problem. You're the problem. You should answer the call so you can see what's going on. So those type of kids be the ones that be set to the side those are the type of kids that may not be getting what they need. And I am speaking on that because I am that parent. I, I, I go to work at three o'clock. School is out at 2.30. So therefore, I pick, when I pick my son up, most of the, I, I can't, in, in the daytime, I do have another job, so I'm working. But I do pop up in between the school hours and let them see me. I also talk to them. The lady, the, the, sec, the secretary, I even holler in the back for the principal, is he available? Is a teacher available? I do, the, do, those, do those things because I'm not always available. I go to work in the evening at three o'clock, so it's very hard for me. And it's very hard for me to try to get my voice out here when you are not asking the 560 to see what we can do to make the school system better. Thank you. I'm gonna be rude with y'all. Let me tell you. I got a grandchild. Lord help me. <laughs> when that five six zero call me, I take a deep breath <laughs> because I don't know if it's him 
one of the other boys, or an adult. <laughs> so if I find that I have missing calls on my phone from the 560 number, I gather myself, I call the school. I ask, did a child call me or an adult? So between that answer, me being put on hold, and receiving whoever it was that called me, I'm ready. So I have to gird myself up to handle what happened. Now, it's not always that case. The child could have called me and said, I left my lunch at home. But I think just again, and I'm, I know I'm repeating myself, I think that relationship will make the difference. Because if you call me and all I get is negativity, I don't want to hear from you because I don't want to respond in a way that's not becoming of me because I have to stay in character for my boys. And if you make the phone call, if you need to stop and breathe before you make the phone call, do that. If you need to write it down and maybe let your colleague read it first, handle it. Because when you call me or someone else, you don't know what atmosphere I mean at the time when you call me. You understand? And I'm speaking for every parent, grandparent, caregiver, guardian. You don't know. So what you get might be what you put out. So I believe that we need to stop, like I tell my boys, you need to stop, drop, and roll. When you find yourself in a situation that you're going to say something that's unbecoming, disrespectful, stop, shut your mouth, drop the thought, and roll out. <laughs> and I would tell them, save yourself. So when I get the 560 number, on my phone, they need to come correct. You need to come knowing you're talking to another human being. You're talking to a parent. And everybody is not as insensitive as others. When you call and talk to me about my child, watch your words. <laughs> I'm just real. Watch your words, because I'm going to come to you with respect. And sometimes I might say, you're right. You're right. When I say that, you're not right. I'm allowing you to think you're right because I'm really not receiving what you're saying to me. So I think to bridge that gap is that we check ourselves and be careful how we communicate in a nutshell. I'm sorry, guys. Miss Paula just, just took me there for a minute. And actually, that was my first sentence on here um, about evaluating ourselves. I wanted to just throw an example out. The, the same thing that she just talked about, it just happened with me. Um, teachers, we have to learn how to talk to one another. I requested for a teacher to call me, and when I got the phone call, I can't tell her when to call me. She called me during school hours. She called me while my son was in the classroom. And as we talking, it was about his progress report. He came home and it was a low grade. So I said, okay, he must be sitting here with no pencil in his hand, no piece of paper in his face. What's going on? No one reached me. The first three weeks of school, no one reached out to me and said, well, your son not doing anything in this classroom. That's something that I should have known in the first three weeks of school, but I didn't. So I made my face more pops up. I need to know until somebody talk to me. I'm going to come in here. I'm not getting on y'all nerves. I don't care. I'm still coming. But anyway, to make a long story short, she says to me, matter of fact, I says, well, I'm, I want to talk to you about his progress report. And she says, oh, I just don't know what to do. Like now, it opens the classroom door and says, my, mm, my son, sit down. I said, wait a minute. Um, could you call him to the phone? And then she calls him to the phone. The phone is on speaker. And he was trying to explain what was going on. And as he was just trying to explain, the only thing he got out was two words, and the teacher said, hush your mouth. I told her, wait a minute, uh-uh, uh-uh, that's where you messed up at. And like Ms. Paula said, I had, to, I had to count to 10. I promise you, I had to count to 10 because I was taking myself back into my activity days. <laughs> you know, I had to count and say, you know, you really messed up. You know, I said, but I'm on my way. And then and, and I can hear her saying, no, 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 no. I said, no, I'm on my way. I hung up. 
I'm getting myself prepared. I'm looking at my boss like I have to run out, but I'm still counting while I'm telling him that and I'll get two more phone calls. That's, I count it, because she called two, two more times. I count it, so I did count to 10. So in the, in the mix of what I'm saying is, then I, hear, I see a text where you say, can we talk? No, where you messed up at is you shut him down. You didn't give him a chance. You don't even know what type of child you're dealing with. You didn't give him a chance to get out the situation. You, wasn't, you didn't hear him. And that loses trust. And he should be able to trust you for the eight hours I allow him to be with you. Okay? Now, what happened was the child picked up the pencil and was holding it in the air for him to get his pencil. That's why he was up. But you didn't listen. Communication, communication. Um, in, in thinking about, I guess, the parents also that we have trouble connecting with when that 560 number comes up, um, we, we have a lot of teachers in schools that are successful in engaging parents and pulling parents in when they do things that center the child in, in a positive way. So I, I, I've been in, in, in being in some of our schools, I've seen where a teacher may be able to take something and, and take a class activity and they turn it into, they do like a little class play or something. And parents, parents show up to see their kids doing something positive and doing something where they're showing a talent or, or applying their knowledge in like a meaningful way. Like parents show up for that. And, but so the more that we can do to create situations that are celebrating the, ch the child and centering the child in a positive way, parents come out for that. Because parent parents love their kids and they want to see their kids do well. They want to see their kids do great. And sometimes you may all parents may not pick up the phone when they see that number. But if they know that their child is being celebrated in the school, then they're going to go out to support their child in that celebration. So that that's a way I think of engaging some parents that we Mr. Mr. Markle. Thank you. Did you want to respond or no? So I, I want to shift gears just a bit and, and listening to you all and, and, and knowing where your children are, for the most part, they're in middle school, high school. So uh, a question from the audience. Do you all see honors classes and AP courses as an option for your children? Yes. Um, I don't think it was an option for, for, for mine. Um, and, and that's just because of the engagement um, that I have with the schools and, and pushing him. Um, toward that pathway, but I, I do think that there are um, areas where there are, where there's a gap. So what I will say, yes, I have that option for, for high school, but for middle school, um, there were a lot of hoops that we had to jump through, um, a lot of proven, I guess, data facts or data points in order to get, um, to get him in uh, like math one and, um, and one of those data points would be the standardized test. And I don't think that those tests actually mark the brilliance of these children. Um, I just don't. So I think that there should be um, some other factors that are factored into whether or not they are able um, to take honors courses, because I think that they can excel if given the opportunity. Any others want to respond to that question? Mm -hmm. Um, is there an opportunity? Yes, it is. Reality, will they have the opportunity? Um, I know, I believe with all this in me, that there are more of our boys that could be in these programs that are not. I think if given the opportunity, again, getting rid of our biases, and looking and making sure, well, you might think, well, handle it, check it out, let's see, 
If they can do this, push them, encourage them. Sometimes if you just encourage me, you'd be amazed at what I might do. Just encourage me, that's all I ask. And I may not know to ask you to encourage me, but have it in you, have the passion in you, you're in the job. You're here to teach, teach, inspire, encourage. Yes, there is opportunity. I just hope that it's open, more open than it has been. Thank you, thank you. We've spoke about relationships. We spoke about having a shared responsibility for reaching our boys of color. I feel that we must take advantage of one of our biggest assets, and that's you. Parents and parents who may be in the audience. So what, my question, what are some ways in which parents can impact outcomes for boys of color across Durham? Um, like Ms. Paula say, said, um, we definitely have to celebrate these children um, and encourage them that they can do um, one of the biggest things for me is being visible and advocating um, for my children and also um, trying to do a little bit more research to understand what my rights as a parent is and what my, my children's rights are within Durham Public Schools. I don't think that that, um, that information is, is nece necessarily transparent. Um, I think that, and if it is transparent, I hadn't seen it and it may not be laid out in a way that, you know, the average person could understand. Um, I think that we have to be, as adults, we have to be uh, slow to speak and quick to listen to these children because I think that they are um, dealing with a whole different set of issues. Um, bullying, um, social media, uh, these falsehoods with with um, with relationships because it's so quick. Every you know, this is kind of like the microwave generation. Um, to me, it's kind of like add water and stir. So we have to meet these children where they are. Um, but we definitely need to to advocate uh, more for the children. Well, I'm a I'm the big I'm my son's advocate. I I'm very strong on that. I I have seen and heard of parents reaching out for a mentor or an advocate for their child when we should be the first on first hand instead of trying to put, I'll, I'll, I'm not gonna say problem, try to put it off on another person to take care of what we should start taking care of at home. We have to make sure that we evaluate ourselves first so our voice can be heard. We Not so much overreacting, um, Someone like enabling our kids, if there are no faults in our kids. If you know your child, you know the faults. You know, you know what they do, basically. You know what they won't do. So when you come to me and, 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 and something concerning my son, I can basically tell you whether it's true, whether he did, whether he, whether he didn't. So it, it, it's not like a battle between me and the, and the school itself. But it's a battle when it comes to him because I have a I have an IEP kid, and I basically know him. And you know I have I had a rough year last year, so I mean I think I'm on speed dial at the um, school board. I mean actually they probably know my number as soon. Hey Miss Walker, you know that type. Yeah, I'm on speed dial because I'm calling. I'm calling the school board on every little thing. That's my backup. I need that. When I, when I, so when I present the school with that, and, and, and I'm trying to help you, I'm there for you, and you pushing me back. I can't help you if you push me back. I, 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 I did some evaluation, so I know me. So I know how I'm gonna approach you. So therefore, we're gonna work, try to work together on these problems, or you know maybe I need to go to the school board again. I need to call them back. We need to do some um, mediation or something. I, I can't help someone that, if they're, they're refusing to help for me. So therefore, I'm, if I'm there to try to help, like I said, I do pop-ups, I let my face be seen. I want, I answer all 560 five, calls. Sometimes, yes, like Ms. Paula said, I be scared sometimes. My son has been bullied. My son had to defend himself. My son right now is suspended. 
for something that I have told them. I, and it's hurting me right now that I have told them this situation, what to look for, and all. I can't keep him home every day. So therefore, I gave you the clues before the school started. My statement, I don't agree with my statement that was sent home. Nine times out of 10, this little boy is gonna tell me what you did, he did, she did, you did, everybody in here did. He gonna tell the truth on anything. So now he got to take a blame for something by himself that the other child didn't get punished for. And I don't feel it's fair. I feel the statement was wrong, first of all. So now you're losing the trust in my child again. You know, because you, you're putting something on paper. You're not letting me help you. And I, like I said before, we do have to evaluate ourselves so we can be heard. So it took me from Friday to Sunday to send out my email of how I felt, because I evaluated myself so I can be heard. You know, I'm waiting on my response. But in the meantime, I'm letting my son do the punishment. But it was in defense. My son was bullied. It took two weeks of bullying to resort to something that could have been prevented. Um, as I'm thinking about what parents can do to impact um, outcomes for boys of color, I, I echo what's been shared. Um, I, I still think about the importance of those parents who are able to be there, are able to be present um, as much as we can to stand in the gap for parents who can, who possibly uh, may not be able to be there. And I also think we need to um, make sure we're checking our mindsets about different parents because sometimes we start to assume that some parents aren't there or aren't supportive or aren't advocating for their child and that's why they're seeing some of the outcomes that they're seeing, and that's not, all, that's not necessarily the case. Like, parents, as we established right off the top, parenting is hard, and you, you can be doing all those things and then still having these, you know, at, bad experiences, and so, you know, we, we as a community have to come together and, and support our, our, chil our, our, chi our children too. And um, we have to do that as parents, and parents can impact outcomes, but you know, it, it's hard for me to take off my educator hat too, because I'm like, on the, on the other end, when parents bring, come to us with this, and they're trying to communicate certain things to us, we have to listen. We, we have to hear what they're saying. And I go back to some of my experiences in the classroom, and I remember some parents coming in to advocate for their child, and, and trying to give us a warning on the front end, like, look, I'm here now to let you know this is what you need to do, and if you don't do this, this is what may happen. We have to listen, you know, and we have to work together. We have to work together as a community if we want better outcomes for our boys. Um, and, I, and I also wanted that, to add that um, we as a community have to promote um, and let parents know that it's okay to ask for help. And so um, there are situations where, you know, parents can't always be available or whatever, and, and because you are, because you need help or you may be weak at a moment, we shouldn't ostracize those people. Um, so we definitely have to promote that it's okay to ask for help because I'm from a generation where it took a whole village uh, to raise us, you know, the candy lady, you know, <laughs> Miss Ann next door or whatever. So we definitely have to ask for help. I have nothing else to say. Did you say that? <laughs> I was going to say that we often speak of um, it takes a village. <laughs> but what does that really look like? It takes a village. And the thing that came to my mind was, it has to be a common unity. There has to be a common unity. And it brings forth community. And it's like, if a parent, I think being visible, whatever that might look like for us, um, is definitely, it can definitely bring common unity in the school community, in the classroom, in the outside community to make that impact. But it has to be a common unity.
Thank you. Um, one more question from the audience before we address our last two questions. And we're looking for just one person to respond to this question. Has your child had an African American male teacher? And has that teacher, did you recognize a difference in that child, in your child, as opposed to a white teacher? So, Mr. Jones, um, <laughs> so like I said, uh, at the introduction, um, Mr. Jones was my son's uh, first grade teacher. And the experience between kindergarten and first grade was so dramatic. And I don't know if I ever expressed that to you, but um, I think that my son has excelled because he's seen um, folks that look like him. And um, there's, I think there's a different accountability level um, when boys of color see other men of color um, in a teaching mode. And, and I think it is beautiful and I think it's wonderful and I'm trying to figure out a way how we can encourage more men of color um, to come into the school and teach these children. I know we said one, you, you, you got a, a comment quick? I do. This is the first year, actually, that my son has actually have had a um, male black teacher, too. And I do see the difference. Matter of fact, those are the only two that he talks about. <laughs> so like she, like Ms. Yolanda said, I wish it, it could be that we can encourage more black males to pick up that position to help out. Because um, this is the only two that actually Montez actually talks about. Beautiful, and, and thank you, Ms. Brasher, for that. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> About to have a moment up here. <laughs> so, so um, each of you have at least a son enrolled in Durham Public Schools. What are some ways that schools have done a, a great job in helping your child, your son, learn? And what are some ways that the school could do a better job? OK, guys, this is the last question. I do want to apologize because I was very nervous the whole time. But um, anyway. Um, <laughs> This last question, I just can't do nothing but be honest about it. I feel my son has been failed with the school system as a whole. I am still currently working out and plans, how can I help with my son's school needs? I have um, wanted to reach out to a, a smaller ratio of school. Just so happened I don't have the funds to put my son where I want my son to be. And I think that would be better for him with his IEP. I have not been pleased with Durham Public Schools, only with two schools, I can say. The school he at now and, and another school, I am very pleased with them. My son is actually in the sixth grade. I kept my son back in the kindergarten. That's when I found out he was having problems. I kept him back for my reasons. Why would I send my son on? That's when I found out things was going on in kindergarten. So I have been, from day one of school, not third grade, I found this out. This is the beginning. So the school system, I don't think I can say anything right now that have helped him. Um, what can I do? I mean, what the next question was, what are some ways that schools um, could do better? They can contact us parents more, get a bond with us, help, help us to help them to help our kids especially help my son. I'm not just talking about my son, I'm talking about everybody's son, because when I say my son, your son is my son. Um, take inventory of boys of color. Get to know them. Get to know what is, what is going on. You don't know, it could be something at home. 
that they're, that they're, they're uncomfortable with. They should be able to come to you and have a conversation and talk to you. But if you, if you pushed them back so many times, how can it? So that, that's being held in. You know, that's, that's trauma to me. So, I mean, just so happened I'm not that mother, but it is mothers that's there. You don't know what's going on in everyone's home. So the school system, to me, they, they really have failed me. They really have, that's a big issue with me. They have, that's why I'm sitting up here. They have failed me. They really have, they I'm failed so, my son. I'm so sorry to hear that, I mean it. But I, that's okay, because I work hard at home. So, but I can't get them what the educators can give them. You know, I can't pass them on. But we work hard, I go to school, I try to do what I can. But I, I mean, really, to be honest, I really think they need to educate them more, their self more in kids with learning problems. They need to educate them more, their, their self in more of every of other areas. You know, you got the intelligent ones, you got the ones that need more help, you got the ones that don't want to do anything. Encourage the ones that don't want to do anything. Find something, make it, make it a happy moment for them to want to do it. You know, I, I work in a mental home. I, I, I do so, something different with them every five women, every day. Five different levels. You can do something. Thank you. If, if anyone has a, a burning remark to this question, I, I would like to get to this last question because you have alluded to it. <clears throat> Parents, in this audience, are people who have a direct impact on student outcomes in their schools. There are teachers, administrators, district administrators here right now and been listening and, and, and learning from you all. And, and, and you just kind of spelled it out perfectly already. But I do want to give other people an opportunity to speak out. What is one thing schools could start doing today that would benefit boys of color coming after your sons? If I had to choose one thing, I would ask DPS to implement um, a curriculum that is a true representation of boys of color or people of color. Um, I think that you know, if we are at home teaching one thing, you know, uh, about uh, Black Wall Street and, and things of that nature, but it's not being echoed at school. Um, I think it may make the children feel like they're less than. And um, I think we definitely need to implement a different curriculum. And I also um, just want to shout out like Southern School of Energy and Sustainability. I know that they um, have a, a new program where they're going back to um, to trades. I don't think that everybody is college ready. I think that we are on that path um, to go to college. I think that we have to individualize these learning plans. I think everybody may need an IEP to, fi <laughs> to figure out what these children really are interested in so that we can build them up and allow them to love it so much they would do it for free and then figure out how to make money doing it. I definitely believe that. One thing I want to do add with what Ms. Jelana said with the IEP, I think we should get, they should have more than what they're pulling them out for. They only get pulled out for two things. That's math and um, English. It's other areas that these kids have problems in. So when she said that everyone should, you know, get evaluated with, for IEP, they need more, the system meet, needs more than just being pulled out for two classes. I re agree with what you said and what she said. I agree. I agree. Um, but one thing I did want to say, um, there's a quote I really would like to give you um, that I look at every day. You know, I can write a sticky note and forget to read it, but this is something that for some reason it catches my attention every day. And it says, if I accept you as you are, I will make you worse. However, if I treat you as though you are what you are capable of becoming, I'll help you become that. And I think that will make a difference in our district. Thank you. Um, I know some, some schools, some school systems adopt the uh, quote, every child, every day. And that's what it really has to be. We have to raise 
the expectations that we have for our boys of color and know that they can meet whatever bar that we set for them. If we put the supports in place, they, they will rise to the occasion. And we have to believe that though. We have to believe that as parents, we have to believe that as educators, we have to believe that as a community, um, we have to believe in our boys. And I also wanna say on, on behalf of the district, I'm, I'm sure I can um, step out and speak on behalf of like our Office of School Relations. We want to follow up um, with, with uh, the parent here sharing those concerns because we can't be a school system that has parents and families in it that feel, that feel like we're failing them. We have to make sure that we're making every effort to meet the needs of every child every day. And so we, we will not let this evening conclude without us connecting and us, us talking more about your specific concerns or any concerns that a parent has here because we have to be about every child. So, yeah. Thank you. So, um, Ms. Walker, Ms. Brasher, Ms. Jennings, Dr. Bullock, thank you all so much for participating in this barbershop talk. And let's give them a hand. You all can come on down. Didn't they do a great job, ladies and gentlemen? They did awesome. So here's the thing about the barbershop. If you've never been in a barbershop, you hear things in the barbershop, you're like, what? OJ did it in the barbershop, right? <laughs> so here's the thing we want. Every time we've had a barbershop talk, we want it to be transparent. We want it to be authentic. We want to hear what it is our students are saying and what our parents say. It isn't because we're not, we're not asking them to come up here to toot the horns for us. We want to know how can we build systems to support our students. Now what I want to do is give some things away. So what I need you to do is take out your ticket. I think I got 15. I got Arby's, I got meals to Arby's, I got meals to Zaxby's, and I got gift cards to Jason's Deli. Somebody said, come on, Jason's Deli. My name is Jermaine, you know, my, know my name, know my name, all right? So, here's what we're gonna do. If I can get uh, Dr. Bullock or Jones, if you guys could help me. It will be the little bitty number. I'm sorry to hear that. I got some people saying. I would like to thank all of our board members who were in attendance. I know that I did see um, Ms. Breyer earlier. I think she has stepped out. We do, I see. Uh, Ms. Minnie Fort Brown in the building as well. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you to Spectrum News for coming out tonight. They said it's going to run at 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. All right. Matter of fact, let's go. what you want? Zaxby's? All right, because, well, you know, with the news, y'all coming out for something good. We need to make sure we give y'all something. Nah, you, you, bro, you know you hungry. Get that man something to eat. You, get that man son. I got you. When it's over, I'm going to get you something to eat. All right. So here is the number. Zero, zero, one, three, six, two. Thirteen, sixty-two. Thirteen, sixty-two. Oh, yeah. So now I see, now I saw two people. Turn the lights on. Y'all can't see? Okay. Y'all need all the lights on? I think I'm the only one. Okay. All right. So, Mr. Jones. All right. So, we said 